I just hope, as you do, that somehow this moment we spent together might be as meaningful as my preparation was. Last night I was kneeling quietly, going over my notes, and you know what I mean, and I don't need to say this in a way that would be misunderstood, but after an hour or so on my knees and looking through the notes and just conversing with the Lord about all the things I wanted to say this morning, I could barely contain my tears thinking about how much I love this book and how overwhelmed I am at the incredible experience we have ahead to take marvelous students through the inspired pages of a book that was written specifically for them and somehow to have them understand that this isn't just a past history but it's an absolute living witness to them you and I love Mormon chapter 8 verse 35 that clearly says behold I speak unto you as if you were present and yet ye are not but behold Jesus Christ has shown you unto me and I know your doings that's a marvelous principle to know that he would speak unto us as if we were present but today if we could help our students understand to somehow feel their presence and to allow us to feel that they are speaking to us as though they were present. That it become that living a witness for us. Somehow for me, I was getting on an airplane about this time of day, getting ready to go fly to a speaking assignment. And as I got on the airplane, a sweet little middle-aged lady was sitting next to me and we had a conversation. I try within three sentences to get into a gospel conversation. It's just kind of a challenge. And, and it's fun. And usually within three sentences, you can get into a good gospel conversation with someone. And so we had our little conversation. I remember saying something about asking her name and where she was from and what kind of things she did. And then just pausing, hoping she would ask me the same. And she did. And she said, so where are you from? Well, I'm from Bluffdale. But I don't ever tell people that. Not that I don't love the place, but if they don't know anything about Salt Lake, they don't know where it is. If they do know something about Utah, they think it's where the prison is. And the prison's not even in Bluffdale, it's in Draper. I just want to make that plain. <laughs> but somehow they don't understand much about that so I just said I'm from the Salt Lake area and she got this little enthusiastic glow in her eye and said are you Mormon and I don't know why it came out like this but to me it was just so living I just been studying Mormon and admiring him so much and thinking about him <laughs> and she just said are you Mormon and I said without thinking about it no if I were Mormon, I'd be tall and strong and handsome and very powerful. <laughs> and it just kind of came out that way. And she said, I don't think I know what you mean. And I said, what do you think Mormon is? And she said, I thought it was a church. And I said, oh, no, it's a man. And he's one of my greatest heroes. Can I tell you about him? And she said, I think you will, whether I say yes or not. Is that true? <laughs> And we laughed, but we had become friends. And I just started to say to her what I wanted her to know so much. Certainly, I had a copy of the Book of Mormon sitting in my briefcase. Yes, I would love to give her a copy and say, can I give you something I treasure so much? But before I did, I just wanted to say to her, do you know any 10-year-old kids? And she said, I do. I have one. I said, boy or girl? She said, a boy. I said, what's he like? She said, total energy, no direction. I said, I understand that. I almost told her that we call them blazers in our church because we don't want to, <laughs> don't want to swear in church manuals and stuff about what we really do. So somehow I said, can you picture a 10-year-old, your 10-year-old, can you imagine your little boy at home and a knock coming on the door and opening the door and seeing a prophet of God standing at your door? who came to interview your 10-year-old son and to say to him, I'm leaving, 
But I want to put all our sacred records into your charge. When he's 10. We had a great conversation about that. To try to understand that Mormon, when he was 10, was put in charge of such incredible things. And she started to relate to that personally as though it were happening in her home for a minute. I said to her, do you have any 13 or 14 year old children? She said, I do. As soon as she said that, she started to tear up. And I said, uh, boy or girl? She said, a girl. I said, it's a hard age, isn't it? And she started to cry. She said, I'm losing her. I don't know what to do. The only thing that matters to her is her friends. They matter much more than I do. I try to give her counsel and she's listening much more to them. She said, I don't know how to help her. I said, I'm so glad we sat together because I think I have some things that might help with your 14 year old. I said, let me tell you about my friend Mormon when he was 14. Most of you know that in Mormon chapter one, verse 13 and 14, which is the very age that he was at the time. He said, I don't even have a single friend that has a spiritual gift. I don't know anyone that has one. We know from section 46, the first spiritual gift happens to be a testimony of Jesus Christ. He said, I don't know anyone that has one. The prophets had been taken away. He didn't have a President Hinckley to listen to. He didn't have a general conference to attend. And somehow with all his friends, not one that he knew having a spiritual gift, by the time we get to verse 15 and 16, we find out he sees the Savior face to face when he's 15. We had a good talk about that because she didn't understand that principle and we discussed that for a few minutes and talked about what he was like and what lessons he learned and how the whole last half of the book, especially the last third, was about the world getting worse while individuals had to get better and specific instructions about how we can get better as the world around us gets worse. She was so intrigued by that idea that somehow we would have a book to teach individuals how to improve when the world is deteriorating around us. And I talked about how Mormon was the very example of that very thing. And he did that when he was 13 and 14 and 15. I talked about his assignment to be a military general. And we discussed that for a few minutes and what it would be like. She had had a brother serve in the military. We discussed what it was like, the environment, his experience. He'd been to war. I said, my friend Mormon was at war all the time. All the time. He spent his life doing that. We tried to talk about what it was like to be in that kind of environment all the time. How you get trained, what you learn, how you feel. But we talked about many other things just briefly. At the end, I explained to her that he had done this for years and years and years. In the midst of doing all that. But somehow during the end of his life, with only a few of his people left, and having said, my kinfolk are dead, now we know what they did when they captured the women and children. If he said his kinfolk are dead, what did they do to his wife and his daughters? They were practicing cannibalism. They were torturing and sacrificing to dumb idols. They were starving them, feeding them on the flesh of their husband and father. Mormon knew that. And as I put myself in the place of understanding Mormon, if someone had offended my wife and my beautiful little girls, could I possibly have picked up the stylus my last time and pressed it into the plates in Mormon chapter 7 and said, I would like to write a love letter to the Lamanites and tell them how much the Lord loves them and how much he wants to bless them. And if they will just turn to him, when they received this message. Would I have written a love letter to my enemies? By the time I talked about that with her, she was in tears again. I said, let me tell you why he stayed so good. His other job was to write a book. The book was not to them, it was to us. He had a prophetic calling to us. 
come up before I share what she said. Let me share with you a quote by President Benson. As you know, there are four basic prophets that have written the Book of Mormon, all except for about seven pages. They clearly understood that the readers would be those of a future generation. The Lord granted them a vision of conditions existing in the latter days. Because of this vision and insight, they were able to provide us with gospel teachings gained from their own experience. Now, here's the quote by President Benson. The Book of Mormon was written for us today. God is the author of the book. It is a record of a fallen people compiled by inspired men for our blessing today. Those people never had the book. It was not meant for them. It was meant for us. Mormon, the ancient prophet, after whom the book is named, abridged centuries of records. God, who knows the end from the beginning, told him what to include in his abridgment that we would need for our day. Mormon turned the records over to his son Moroni, the last recorder. And then Moroni, writing over 1,500 years ago, speaks to us today, and that's when he quotes again, Mormon 8.35. I speak in you as if you were present. This book is written for us, and I wanted her to know it was written for us. And when I got to that point and explained it, I said, he did abridge a book, and I have a copy of it right here. Would you like to read what he wrote? And she said, it would be such an honor for me to have a chance to read what he wrote. I said, I want to tell you something. There are answers for 14-year-old girls in this book. There are answers for parents and families. And I showed her some references that might help. She eagerly took the book from my hand and started to read it during the trip. And we continued to talk about this beautiful book. Somehow, our first challenge with our students is to help them personalize the book. Help them recognize that this is not a history book. If it is, it's a terrible one. It is. If it's a history book, it's just atrocious. We covered two or three hundred pages of, or years of history in two pages. We spent 18 pages on a dad sitting with his boys one night. That would not hit the headlines today. You can't imagine opening your newspaper tonight and saying, Father talks to boys. That might be a headline experience, as rare as it happens, but somehow it was not written as a history. In fact, one of the beautiful studies, if you want a great experience, look through the book and notice when they do just a sweeping mention of things, and then when they turn on the microscope and spend so much time on individual isolated incidents, and write down the themes of all those isolated incidents and find out that the major themes of the Book of Mormon are absolutely focused on our most pressing needs. And the other historical things are just brushed over. We don't spend much time on them at all. So I really think every one of us can find ourselves asking, exactly as President Benson said, why was this put in the book for us? They were inspired. They only wrote the hundredth part. Why is this hundredth part included? Why is this in there for me? What did they see about my day that would make this meaningful to me? Somehow, I was sitting in a symposia like this. Okay, a conference. Okay, a conference. And, and somehow as we were at the conference, I heard a great scholar on the Book of Mormon and he was going through the major themes of the book and he hit Alma 43 and all of a sudden he said, oh, this is just the war section. Let's just jump over it. And he jumped from Alma 43 to Alma 63 and went on into the Book of Helaman and didn't say anything. Oh, if you have your book, just a minute. Just a minute. Jacob chapter 4 gives us a beautiful insight about understanding a little bit of effort put in by these writers. Jacob 4 gives us a perspective about what they thought when they were writing. And in verse 1 he says, Behold, it came to pass that I, Jacob, having ministered much unto my people in word, and then he parenthetically says, says, and I cannot write but a little of my words because of the difficulty of engraving our words upon these plates. Also, and we know that the things which we write upon the plates must remain. And everything we don't write will perish. Just his insight about how much effort. And Jacob said how hard it was for him to write on the plates. And he got seven chapters done. How many chapters are in the 43 through 63? 
that we just skip over with a brush of the pen and say, this is just the war section. You want to talk about personalization? Why would they write this story about all that war? So we start reading it and understanding it and seeing it, especially when we think about Mormon. What did Mormon name his son? Of course he named him Moroni. Why? Best we know, Chief Captain Moroni. You can be named after Moroni, that you can understand and relate to this incredible man, that you will have many of the same missions to fulfill. And he named him Moroni. And we meet Moroni only in chapters 43 through 63 of Alma. And if we find with our students that we focus on the war, the war is the backdrop, of course. But what's the purpose? Look at Alma 48. What's the purpose of that whole war section, for example? And to really personalize and have it come alive. We know these verses. The young women know these verses really well. They know them almost as well as they know the young women's theme. They have these verses underlined, and they write down a wonderful message to themselves about, this is the husband I want. Starting in verse 11, And Moroni was a strong and a mighty man, a man of perfect understanding. Now, how's that for miraculous? A man with perfect understanding. That's amazing. Yea, a man that did not delight in bloodshed, who sold a joy in the liberty and freedom. If you look at verse 11, it looks like, wow, what a great civil leader. What a great civic leader. This would be great, but it goes on. I love verse 12. A man whose heart did swell with thanksgiving to his God for the many privileges and blessings which he bestowed. Now, come on. He was out being a general. He was out fighting. He was fighting war, but still he saw so many blessings. And was just his heart swelling with thanksgiving, verse 13. Yea, but he was a man who was firm in the faith of Christ and had sworn with an oath to defend his people, even to give his life. Wow. And then, you know, the famous verse, the summary verse. Verily, verily, verse 17. I say unto you, if all men had been and were and ever would be likened to Moroni, behold, the very powers of hell would have been shaken forever and the devil would never have power over the hearts. Of How would you like that on your tombstone? If all men would be like this man, the very powers of hell would be shaken forever and the devil would never have power over the hearts of the children of men. Why did Mormon write about Moroni? But a spiritual battle we're all fighting every day. And if we could know Moroni's powerful lessons, we could bind Satan out of our lives. And he would never have power over our hearts again. And when that man just jumped over those pages, I sat in the back of the room just hurting inside and thinking, these pages have taught me more about binding Satan out of my life and the pattern and the powerful principles that can make that happen. Let's just review them and see them quickly. Why Moroni? Why Moroni? What did he do? Moroni standing there as a young man being in charge. What did he use first? This huge military was coming toward him. He was outnumbered. Are your students outnumbered? They go to school every day thinking, I'm just so isolated and alone and I just have to fight this battle even with some of their LDS friends. And somehow being able to stand up and stand for their standards, if they're going to do that today, are they going to feel outnumbered? And, and they're outnumbered so much. And this huge army comes toward them. But what have they done to prepare themselves? They put on their armor. And they're standing there dressed in armor. Who made the comparison to the armor? Jesus Christ said in section 27 of the Doctrine and Covenants, put on the armor of God every day. Strap it on. Because you're going to a battle. And you've got to have your armor on. If we just watch Moroni and every one of our students would learn how to strap on their armor every day and go out into their battle, they would start the process of binding Satan out of their lives. And if they could see the relevance of this as they personalize. Somehow, what's the very next thing he does? Because all his enemy runs away when they see them in armor. You know that. What's the very next thing he does? But to grab one of his guards and say, run to Alma and ask him what to do. Who's Alma? He's the prophet. What about actively following prophets? What about teaching students to bind on the armor every day? Actively follow prophets in our lives. Seek out what they're saying. Actively do what they say. Follow their guidance and you'll be prepared. Very next thing he faces is an internal enemy that comes up from inside to attack him. Someone from inside, not outside. This is Nazarahemna. No, this is someone that lives next door. What does he do to stay strong? He stands on his covenants. He strengthens and uses and bears his testimony. Oh, yes, the title liberty is so great, but what's it about? It's about covenants and testimony. If they're binding on their armor every day and they're actively following prophets and they're standing by their covenants and keeping them, 
and working on their testimonies and sharing it. Are they making good progress toward binding Satan out of their lives? But we're not done. The enemy, this knowledgeable enemy, will come back and attack them again. And what happens this time? They decide they will go p attack their weakness because they know their weakness. What has he done to his weakest place? He's made it his strongest place. Ooh, Ether tells us about this in chapter 12, doesn't he? Verse 27. Behold, I gave unto men weakness that they may be humble, but my grace is sufficient for all men who humble themselves and come unto me. For behold, if they humble themselves and come unto me, I will make weaknesses strengths. Ooh, that principle. What if our youth were binding on the armor, actively following prophets, keeping their covenants, working hard on their testimony and sharing it with others, and then lengthening their stride to make their weaknesses strengths? Would they have a formula for overcoming? Brothers and sisters, all the way through the book. For example, just one other quick example. The stripling warriors. So many of you wonderful sisters are here. You love the stripling warrior story because the mothers. Did you notice the verse before the mothers? Did you notice the verse that says they thought more upon the liberty of their fathers? It's right there. Fathers. And the teachings of their mothers. It just, you know, when the book comes alive for us, when it starts to live, it's just amazing to realize that just weeks before, months before, a few years before, and if we look back carefully, we know what happened to these fathers. These fathers woke up one morning and hugged their wives and hugged their children, had family prayer and hugged their wives again and walked out into the streets and walked out with all the other men and closed the doors of the city and walked out into a plain and they could hear the drumming of the of the army in the mountains, and they walked out and knelt down on the plain, no armor, no swords, no fighting. They just knelt down and said, Heavenly Father, please bless these men that are about to take our lives. Please, Heavenly Father, bless my wife. Please, Heavenly Father, bless my children. And coming over a hill came a massive army, and they slaughtered a thousand five of them that day. Did this only happen once in the book? No, it happens at least twice. We don't know how many really were lost. How many homes that night were without dads? How many little single parent moms were in Ammon's city after a thousand five men were killed in one day? Why did they think on the liberty of their fathers? My dad was willing to give his life for his testimony. My dad went out and knelt down out there in the field. And my mom has taught me. And we love the stripling warriors. And we love the stories. And we know that President Benson stood and said, when I look at our youth today, I see Helaman's 2,000 sons. I see them as stripling warriors today, and that's who they are. And that's, that's a powerful comparison. But sometimes, after we get done with the original battle, we don't ask a couple of quick questions that are so powerful. This little, this little moment of what they can do. Why didn't, they, why didn't they die? Why didn't they die from the battle? Just for a minute, Alma 48. 58, I'm sorry. Turn to Alma 58. Nope, we're on 57. I'm sorry, page 353. 57, verse 24. They have this huge battle. By the time they get done with the battle, what do they do? What do they do? Verse 24, And it came to pass that after the Lamanites had fled, I immediately gave orders that my men who had been wounded should be taken from among the dead and caused that their wounds should be dressed. And it came to pass that out of my 200 and 2,060 who had fainted because of loss of blood... Nevertheless, according to the goodness of God and their great astonishment, why didn't they die? Because the prophet of God said to these marvelous stripling warriors, you go out on the battlefield, you grab your wounded, passed out, fainted brethren who were bleeding to death out there, you bind up their wounds and carry them back. If they had not done that, the book would not say what it does. They were willing to bind up their brothers and sisters. They were willing to go out and get the ones that were wounded laying out there. And our prophet, President Hinckley, stood up with tears in his eyes and changed his whole talk that day of the conference. We have this by direct authority. He had written a different talk. And he stepped into that conference day. And you know about the rescue. You've heard about it so much because it's one of our favorite talks. But he stood up that last day of conference and he said with all his heart, he said it was 150 years ago at this pulpit when Brigham Young sent him out to go rescue the people. And I'm calling you on the second rescue. 
Because we have young people out there that are dying. We have young people out there that are in need, and we need to go out and bind them up and bring them back and bind up their wounds, and it's exactly the same. We have had a prophet exactly the same as theirs. Call us to the rescue and to go out and get them from the field and to come bind them up and to somehow relate to the stripling warriors. This, I know, was written for us. Somehow to personalize, somehow to personalize it, but it's more. That's the first principle, personalize the book so that every time they read it, every question they ask is simply this. Why was this written for me? What does this mean in my personal life? The war section, all the sections, all of it, it's just powerful. And I testify that I believe with all my soul, every time Mormon put his stylus to the plates, he was asking the question President Benson said, what would matter to them? He is told in Mormon chapter 1, you have seen the Savior, but do not tell your people about it because they are past feeling. You can't talk to them. Don't preach to them. So whose prophet was he? If he was a prophet, whose prophet was he? He couldn't be their prophet. He couldn't even teach them. He was our prophet. We know that. Let's go to the next principle. The next principle powerfully is relevance. Not only is it personalized and given directly for us, but the messages are so relevant, they're the way we breathe every day. They are massively relevant in our lives. Students need something that's so relevant that it changes the way they live today. If it doesn't matter in the next 24 to 30, 36 hours, it probably won't matter. Somehow they just relate to, will it help me right now? Will it help me when I walk out the door? Will it help me with my relationships today? Will it, will it do something for me now? It can't just be, well, someday when you go on a mission or something else. It's different. Relevance is so beautiful. I would just share with you with all my heart. I love this part of the book. I love my seminary teacher who taught me the Book of Mormon. Because in my day when I was 16 and my parents had filed for divorce and my dad was living in the bachelor apartment and my mom was living up at the house and things were stressed and it was hard. And I had learned the Book of Mormon from a wonderful seminary teacher and I learned to love it. And I cared about it and I was driving down the street one day and I had a problem. And the problem was just in my heart. I was just hurting and I thought, I really need a blessing. I'd had a priesthood lesson on Father's blessings and I thought, I really need a blessing. And I thought about going to my dad and going down and knocking on his bachelor apartment and asking for a blessing. And I knew he was so discouraged and I thought, oh, that'd be so hard for him. How could I do that? And I remember thinking, just go to your bishop. It'll be okay. And then, brothers and sisters, as though Nephi, a living witness, sat in the seat next to me, clearly in my mind came the moment of Nephi walking back into camp with a broken bow, watching his father Lehi struggle and complain against God. And Nephi went out quietly and carved the bow and returned directly to his dad and said, Dad, where should I go hunt for food? I need revelation and I need it from you. I can almost hear Lehi say, why don't you pick up the Lehi yourself? You're not complaining. No, Dad, you're my dad, and you're my priesthood leader, and here I am. And for me, one 16-year-old kid, driving down the street, the Book of Mormon became a living witness and was alive. And I heard these words in my heart. You go to your father. Go to your father. It was not easy. And I went to my dad and I knocked on the door and I talked to him for a minute and I told him I needed a blessing. And he quietly said, I just don't think I can give you one right now. And I said, I didn't say I needed one right now. And he said, are you willing to wait? And I said, I am willing to wait. He said, then I will get ready. And my Lehi went into his tent. And it brought my dad back. And it brought me back to my dad. When I see Nephi after this life, I just want to hug him and say, you changed my life. I will never forget the blessing my dad gave me two months later. He said things in that blessing that were so personal to me, more meaningful than my patriarchal blessing as we had fasted and prepared together for that blessing. I just shared that much of that little account as we were in the midst of the broken bowl and a beautiful little girl from Canada sitting in my class at the Institute had the Spirit say to her, you can reach your dead. She just got this clear message, a book will work for you, you can reach your dead. 
She walked out of class right afterwards. She called her dad on the phone and said, Dad, I'm learning some great things at school. He said, it's good because I'm paying a lot of money and I want you to learn. <laughs> she said, Dad, some of them are about religion. He said, you know how I feel about that. She said, I do, Dad. But Dad, I love you so much and you love me more than anyone. I've always dreamt of what it would be like to have you give me a blessing. To have your hands be the ones to give me a blessing. He said, let's talk about something else. That was in September. December, it was the end of the semester. The kids were going home in three days. She walked into our final exam. She said, can we have a brief devotional before our final? I said, that'd be great. She said, can I give a little spiritual thought? She said, you don't know me in the class. She said, you don't know about my personal circumstance, but my dad's been inactive for 19 years. She said, last September, when we were studying the book, the Spirit clearly said to me, that I could follow Nephi's example and reach my dad. She told about the original phone call and how unresponsive he was. She said, I called him last night on the phone and said, Dad, I'm coming home in three days. I can't wait to see you. She said, oh, you can't imagine how excited I am to have you come. And she said, Dad, I've learned some great things while I've been here. And he said, that's good. She said, some of them are about religion. He said, you know how I feel about that? She said, I do. And then she said he started to cry. I will never forget her standing up quietly in class and just saying. Then my dad, through his tears, said, I'm so sorry. I just can't wait till you get home. I wanted to surprise you. What you said to me last September on the phone touched me so much. I went to see the bishop the next week. I just finished Project Temple last week. I was ordained an elder last Sunday. I have a present wrapped under the tree that says, Can I give you a father's blessing while you're home for Christmas? Hurry home, hon, because... I've been learning some great things, and some of them are about religion. We didn't need to take the final. The test of life was in the relevance of how we were applying that principle. There are so many examples like that. You know them. They're just laced through the book. They're just everywhere. How many of your students are going to have incredible challenges and trials? How many of them are facing incredible difficult problems in their life? When they get to Mosiah 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, right in that little section, why did Mormon, our wonderful friend, take three incidents that aren't even chronologically related and tuck them together and right next to each other? Why did he show Noah facing his greatest challenge? And when Noah faced his problems, he ran away. His lifestyle had been so selfish and self-centered that he ran away and even said, leave the women and children and come, save yourselves. How many men in our society are running away from their families? How many times is this happening today? How many times are families being broken up for this very thing? How come we have books coming out called The Fatherless Society? How come we're going through that very thing today? Why did Mormon write this and say they might run away and leave their homes? When I think about my problems and I think about no, and when I get a clear view of it, I don't want to run away. And if our students could relate to that and say, when I face my problems, I don't want to be a no and run away. Limhi, his son, is on the same tower. Right chapter, he faces exactly the same problem. It's exactly the same army coming. And what does he do? He tries hard. He tries really hard. He even prays about it. But he's been raised by Noah. What was family home evening like in Noah's court? Limhi doesn't know some principles. He tries really hard, but he ends up, because the problem won't go away, fighting back with anger. Notice when you study it, it's because the problem lingers. He does pretty well the first time, but then it just lingers and stays, and he just, he starts fighting back, and he sends his army out three additional times, and they lose every time, and almost every home loses a man, and it's a pathetic part of the book. It's not because Limhi's not a great man. As soon as he gets back, he just begs for baptism. He just, he begs Alma to baptize him. He's great. He just didn't know. What are the two most often used approaches on problems today? Run away or fight back with anger? What are the two things that destroy marriages the most? Run away, fight back with anger. What can we do to help our students see that there's a pattern here? The very same problem happens to Alma right after that. The very same army, the very same group, the very same challenge. And there's Alma, the elder. Remember in verse tw chapter 23 and 24? 
of Mosiah, and there he's standing there in his city, and the very same army comes, and all the people run in and say, there's an army coming. They bathe their bodies with animal blood. They shave their heads bald. They have their swords unsheathed. They're coming to fight. What shall we do? And Alma says, I don't know. I'm just a man like you, but let's pray. And they kneel down and pray about it. And he turns and says, women, stay here. And he walks out of the gates of the city and faces his army head on. No sword, no anger. Just faces his problem head on with the Lord on his side. This is a very interesting part of the book to me. Brothers and sisters, when my parents were going through their troubles and my little brother was doing drugs and it was his way of running away was getting into the drugs. This man helped me put my feet down and not run away. I wanted to face problems like Alma. I wanted to put my feet down and not run away. I wanted to face them with the Lord's help. I know your students are going to have incredible challenges and they can learn powerful, relevant lessons on how we face them. Well, what do they do? So Alma walks out and faces it head on. And the next verse should say, and they lived happily ever after. No, what are you going to teach your students about that? Because it gets worse. It gets worse. Amulon's waiting for them, a wicked priest of Noah. He hates him already. He is put to be their ruler and he wants to destroy them. He puts burdens on their back and whips them and drives them up and down the streets. Look at the footnotes and read this part. After he drives them up and down the streets, it's not working, so he grabs their children and beats them. And they're not fighting back with anger and they're not running away, but they're just being strong. And he knows this because they're praying. And so he puts guards over them so they will not pray. I don't know if that's a funny verse to you, but how many guards would it take to stop everybody from praying? This is a one-on-one -on -one thing. And boy, you wouldn't nod off in church because if you did, <laughs> I wasn't praying. <laughs> but there they were. And they just prayed in their hearts. It's just so beautiful. They just look them right in the eyes and pray, pray, pray. <laughs> and then the formula comes, brothers and sisters. And I believe this is as strong a formula in the book as there is in the book. Preparing your students for the second coming period of time when it's going to get really hard. Because sometimes the problems don't go away. And sometimes when we face that, this happens to be in chapter 24 of Mosiah, verse 13, 14, 15. It happens to say this, the Lord didn't take the problems away, but he did strengthen their backs that they could bear their burdens with ease and cheered their hearts. Strong backs and cheerful hearts. Sometimes because the problems don't go away, you think the Lord doesn't care that he's not there. I promise there are students in your classes that are going to be in difficult challenge. And somehow... If they will know the Lord is there, even if the problems don't go away, but he will be there to strengthen your heart, to cheer your heart and to strengthen your back. My friend, when I was a brand new bishop, came and knocked on my door, a boy in my ward, fell in my arms crying. We took him into the study. He sat down weeping. He said to me, they use an ax on my mom. In this tragic story, he had come home from work and he found his mother and his sister brutally murdered. This young man, 21 years old, five weeks home from a mission, inactive most of his young life, struggled some, decided to clean up his act and go on a mission. He did, and now he was home five weeks, and his mom and his sister were gone. This incredible challenge. Is this going to go away? How do I counsel him as his bishop? What do I say? It'll be okay. No. Four days later, we were in a mortuary. He walked over and looked at the two caskets. He started to cry. He was struggling so much with all the memories. We walked across the hall. I held him in my arms. He said, Bishop, pray with me. He said, Heavenly Father, I learned on my mission I can't do anything alone. I need your help today. Please be with me. I'm the only member in my family. I need to give strength. Please help me. As he finished his prayer in the name of Jesus Christ and said, Amen, I literally felt his back strengthen. I had my arms around him and he just stood taller and he looked at me and said, Bishop, I don't even know how to explain this to you, but I feel the Lord standing right there. I feel his arm around my shoulder. I'll be fine. He went out and greeted people and I literally saw the scripture come alive. He got up at the funeral and gave a powerful talk in front of 300 non-members about faith and hope. And there wasn't a dry eye in the audience when he got done teaching out of the book of Alma at the funeral. And I thought I knew strong back and cheerful heart. No, no, he called me a year later and said, come with me to the prison. I have an interview with the man that killed my family. I want you to be there. We sat next to each other as he sat in a tiny cubicle. The prisoner finally came in and sat down. 
My young friend was the first one to speak when he said, this must be hard for you. I was impressed that the young man was thinking about the prisoner and how hard it must be for him. I had no re idea why he was there. I didn't know what he was going to say. He hadn't told me. The prisoner said, it is hard for me. Why are you here? And this fine, young, 22-year-old boy now said, I've hurt so much since you killed my family. But he said, I was thinking about you the other day and realized you hurt more than I do. And that just overwhelmed me and I wanted to come and see if I could help you somehow. The man looked back and said, why don't you hate me? He said, oh, I have a hero, his name is Christ and he's literally taken the hate away. The man said, I don't even believe in God. I've been abused since I was a little kid. I don't think there could be a God. And my young friend said, well, maybe that's why we're here, so we can teach you about God. For an hour and a half, we taught him the gospel. At the end of an hour and a half, this man looked in the eyes of a 22-year-old boy and said, I've never believed in God one day till right now. You're strong, but you're not this strong. You couldn't do this alone, could you? He said, no, I couldn't. He said, you are my greatest witness there's a God, and for the first time in my life, I really believe there is. I testify to you, brothers and sisters, that was about this principle. It was a Mosiah 24 experience where his back was strengthened and his heart was cheered, and he went through a problem being absolutely comforted, and the book had become alive, relevant, present, now, living witness in his heart. Give him strength. Bring us to the Savior. It's here so powerfully. Personalization. Relevance. Last one, every day, every day, somehow application. Somehow that idea, and we know this, all of us know this, but to somehow really be able to say, okay, this is written for me. Okay, this is really impactful in my life today. How can I apply a principle out of what I learned today, right now in my life? How can I make it relevant in what I'm doing? And to somehow have that come alive. That application part has taught me the best by my sweetheart. And just briefly, I will just say, I came home one day because she wanted this to come alive for my children. She wanted them to know the layman Nephi lesson. How powerful is it right from the first to say, here are two people that go through the same experience. They live in tents next to each other. They have the exact same experience. And one is hating life and having an awful time and struggling and hurting and having difficulty in his relationships. And the other is finding joy in every day. And who do you want to be? Who do you want to be? In my little class, I've asked many times, we would read a little about Laman, we'd read a little about Nephi, and then would say, how many of you ladies want to marry a layman? How many of you have as your greatest goal saying, oh boy, I'd love a layman that complains about everything that ever happens and hates my cooking and all the rest, and somehow, you know. And I've said to him, how many of you men want to marry a laymanita? You know, and because two of the daughters of Ishmael were right in there, you know, they were part of the group. And, and then how, how come you want to marry a Nephi, ladies? And, and they would talk about Nephi and what he's like and why. But they're right next to each other. They just, the difference, you know the difference. Chapter 2 of 1 Nephi tells us what? Verse 12, Laman and Lemuel do not know the dealings of God. Verse 16, Nephi, I, Nephi, cried unto the Lord. He did visit me and soften my heart. I know this is the Lord's work. I'm doing it because he wants me to. I'm not just going through the motions. How many of our students go through the motions of it all? Just go through the motions. My wife didn't want that. So one day when I got home, the little lame and Nephi lesson was happening. My children were standing there with bandanas tied around their heads. I walked in and said, what's going on? They said, mom's being weird. <laughs> Pretty soon she was there with my bow and arrow and out in the wilderness we went and we got up to the backyard and a big sign that said the wilderness and we had arrived. My wife said, what if we never go home again? My son jumped up and said, I'll starve. She said, you won't, because Dad has his bow and arrow with him. She looked at me and said, have you seen him use his bow and arrow? We're going to start. In the midst of all this fun together, we hiked around the hills that night. We went and got another family and encouraged them to come. We had a little Leahona. We followed it. It led us to food. We went through the experience. We had crickets singing in our ears and sand in our shoes, and it was real. And these little kids were just experiencing and applying it in their lives. And at the end, I said, let's see if you've learned anything. Act like Laman and Lemuel just a minute. I will not ever say that to my children again. <laughs> Don't need to, they do it without me asking. And then I said, now act like Nephi. And I remember my son jumping up and saying, great dad, just like Nephi, huh? 
When we had the closing prayer and we went out to clean up the wilderness, I said, anybody want to help me? And my son jumped up and said, great, Dad. And that became this little saying. He just kept saying, he didn't always do it, but he always said it. I didn't know that I would interview him at eight and say to him, someday they're going to try to get you to smoke. He said, Dad, that already happened. I said, you're only eight. He said, it happened when I was seven. Riding down the canal road, some kids were out there smoking. They tried to get us to smoke. My buddy was smoking. I was all alone. I said, what'd you do? His statement to me was simply this. Dad, would Nephi smoke? And somehow the application had become so real that when he's all alone on the road, and a 13-year-old kid is looking in his eyes, and he's seven, he was not alone because Nephi was right there. I said, someday they're going to try to show you pornography. He said, Dad, that already happened too. I said, what happened? I was over at the neighbors. My buddy took me out in the garage to show me his dad's magazines. He said, I looked at it the first time because I didn't know what it was, but I thought I can't do that again. So we were back a couple of days later, and he said, let's go look at my dad's magazines. He said, Dad, I didn't want to do that, but I didn't know what to do, so I just said, I got a better idea. Let's eat. <laughs> and they went and got some hot dogs, and they went up to, to cook them out in the fire pit, but they couldn't find anything to burn, so they went and got his dad's magazines and burned them. <laughs> that, that's a true story. I just love it. How did I know that this same boy would come home from senior high school football and say, Dad, only three of us in the locker room don't use the Lord's name in vain. How did I know he would come home and say they don't use the names or talk about girls in that way? They use the B word every time they talk about a girl in the locker room and their mother. And I'd look in his eyes and say, boy, the conditions have changed a little today. How did I know he would get a football contract? And go away to play college football and be so excited about his dream coming true and then have to hang up his cleats and leave his college contract behind and go on a mission. Today I hugged him at the airport. I hugged him so hard till he couldn't breathe. He hugged me so hard till I couldn't breathe. He started down the little corridor and I said, I have a great mission, son. I will never forget him turning around. This is exactly what he said. Great dad, just like Nephi, huh? And he quoted to me his seven-year-old experience. I said, you decided this when you were seven, didn't you? And he said, yes. Somehow, the application to get it alive for them, to really help them understand this is a personalized text to them. It's to them. It's about them. It's for them. But then it's relevant, and it's so relevant that it's, it's just like today's newspaper. It just matters so much, but more inspired. It's just great. That the application, the only thing missing out of the personalization, relevance, and application is you. You can tell them that is you. And then if you put the P and the R and the A and the Y together, you could say on your little bulletin board, pray your way through the Book of Mormon. Personalize it every day. Relevant. Apply it when you get done. And get yourself into the book. Pray your way through the book. Though we've only talked about half of what I wanted to, I will testify with all my heart that by the time they get to Third Nephi, if they'd be prepared, they will understand that the Lord's greatest desire is to be one with them. I have never been touched so much in my life as when I fully understood, at least to my ability to comprehend, that in chapter 19, verse 22 and 23 of Third Nephi, the perfect resurrected God, Jesus Christ, the resurrected God, kneels in front of his people and pleads this prayer. Father, I am grateful that thou hast given him the Holy Ghost. I just want to ask one thing. Could I be one with them as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee? Could I be one with them? The Savior, Jesus Christ, desires to be one with your students and with you and with me. The only thing that stops that from happening is us. I testify this book is so personalized, so relevant, so filled with application, they can teach us how to be one with the Savior, Jesus Christ. I met him as a 15-year-old in Third Nephi in this book and have never been the same. I know he lives. And know that this most correct book can bring us closer to God than any other book and leave it humbly in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.